the opportunity to stand behind this pulpit. I want to first and foremost honor our pastor, senior pastor Marco Garcia. The first time I heard pastor speak, he preached a message on a man named Mephibosheth that changed my life forever. And I am so, so blessed and honored to be able to sit with this man on a regular basis. And you are too, to hear his messages, to hear what God gives him on a regular basis. And this is what I love about him. He's a leader, developer. He's making disciples. You got evidence all around. You got Pastor Christian, who's our campus pastor here at Hallmark. You got Pastor Joe at Arrowhead. You got Pastor Chris at Pomona. Where are my Pomona lights at? we got people all over the world that are being developed because he is secure in what God has called him to do, and that's develop leaders, and that's one of the reasons I get to stand here tonight. So thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity. I want to um, share tonight from 1 John chapter 1 and 2. Now, we're going to dive into this. It's uh, you know right in the middle of a series on the cross. How many of you have been blessed by that series on the cross that we've been doing with Pat, Christian and Gavin and both shared uh, amazing messages about the cross? And of course... The reality is that there is no message apart from the cross, so I'm safe to say I would be preaching about the cross tonight, but I also wanted to tie it together with our daily growth book. Right now in our daily growth book, we're going through 1 John, and uh, it has been powerful, it has been life transformative, and I want to uh, jump in that with you tonight. So let's pray for tonight's message. Father, we just thank you. Thank you, God, that you never stop speaking. Thank you, God, that you have something for every person in this room. Holy Spirit, we ask and expect that you will speak to every heart, that you will change us, that we will be different when we walk out of here, that people will be saved tonight. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're going to move on hearts and draw men to yourself tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. All right, awesome. Well, I'm going to start with uh, a little bit of information about this book that we're going through, okay? It is 1 John chapters 1 and 2 tonight, and it's interesting because John is writing to us in around 85 or 90 AD, okay? So this is a good amount of time. I'm going to back this off a little bit. This is a, a good amount of time apart from when Jesus walked the earth. Jesus ascended to heaven in around 33 AD, and John is writing almost 60 years later. He's an 80-year-old, 80 80-plus-year-old 80 man who's writing to the New Testament church. John is the apostle that it says in John 13, 23, that Jesus loved, right? So he has a close relationship with Jesus. And when he's writing, this is the time in the church where people for the first time are coming into church, becoming Christians who have never met or heard Jesus speak. So these are people that have not personally met Jesus. And so John writes to them to really address the most important question anyone could ever ask. And I want to propose this question to you. We're going to look at this question closely. This is a question that we all have to answer at some point in our lives. And the question is this, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Every one of us in this room needs to answer that question. Every one of us in this room has to come to a point where we understand who he is. And we need to decide from that point whether we will accept or reject his life and what he offers. So John writes to a group of Christians that are new to the faith, as well as to those that have been in the church for a long time, and he's trying to address a few different things. But let's look at John for a moment. He's one of the original 12 disciples. He's walked and talked with Jesus. He saw him heal. He heard him teach. He watched him die. He met him in his resurrected form, and he saw him ascend to heaven. He was also one of Jesus' closest friends, and along with his brother James and the apostle Peter, got to spend some additional time with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration and in the Garden of Gethsemane, which we'll talk about a little bit more. As such, it's safe to say that John probably knew Jesus better than anyone else alive at this time. At the time of John's writing, all the other disciples, the 12, have been martyred. He's the only one that's still living, and he's writing to us to answer the question, who is 
Jesus. It's not just an informative, truthful answer. It's a life-changing and powerful answer. Thank you, Jose. Give it up for Jose. Are we still popping? We're good. All right. Thank you, sir. So who is Jesus? Let's look at the first thing that John has to say. Jesus is life. Someone say, Jesus is life. No, no. Say it like you mean it. Jesus is life. All right. So let's look at 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, just to begin here. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself, powerful statement, was revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. One more bit of background information about this statement that John's making. John is writing to the church at a time where there's been a lot of heresy that's come in, people that are bringing false doctrine to the church. One of the things that they're teaching is that Jesus never walked the earth physically, that he was just a spirit that walked around on the planet and never made even a footprint Another group is saying he couldn't possibly have had a body because the body in and of itself is evil. This is both lies. They're not things that are found in the Bible. They're not true. They come from Greek philosophy, and they're infiltrating the church. So John takes a very strong stance. He says, listen, guys, I saw Jesus. I walked with him. I saw him do miracles. I sat beside him at the campfire. I listened to his sermon on the mount. I watched him sweat blood and, dream, and, and cry as he wept in the garden of Gethsemane. I saw him as he gave his life on the cross. I saw him in his resurrected form. He's real. And this is what John is inviting us to. He's inviting us to know a real living person. It's amazing to think that the same Jesus that walked the earth with John can now be in relationship with you. And that's exactly where we're going with this. But look at this word life that John identifies Jesus at. Um, I had somebody recently say, why do we ever look at the Greek word or the Greek definition? Well, the reason is that any of you who know our English, English second language in here, anybody speaking English as a second language, you might have learned that not every word translates exactly. Not every word translates with the same nuances and understanding. And so sometimes we look at the Greek just to add to our understanding of what the author, in this case John, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, is saying. And so John is saying that Jesus is life, meaning, if we have the definition, the absolute fullness of life that belongs to God. We're going to go with this instead. That sounds good. So... Interestingly enough, I actually chose the lavalier because I have a tendency to shout. And I thought, you know, this will be good for me. I'll learn how to just speak quietly and, 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 and teach and do like Pastor would. And Pastor tells me all the time, you don't always have to shout, Mike. And I said, you're right, Pastor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to teach. But tonight, uh, we're looking at this definition of life. The definition of life, that Jesus is life. It's the absolute fullness of life that belongs to God, a happy life now filled with every kind of blessing, eternal life, and the hope thereof, a real, genuine, active, and vigorous life devoted to God both now and forever. Now, this is a kind of a long definition, but I love it because it talks about the absolute fullness of life. Jesus is not life like you've ever known it before. Jesus is a life that you've always longed for. Jesus is life to the full, life in abundance. In fact, he says in John 10, 10 of himself, the thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Now, I don't know about you, but there's been some times in my life where I knew I was not living this kind of life. I did not have a full life. I did not have an abundant life. I had a less than life. At this particular time in my life, I'll share a story. I was working for Merrill Lynch as a financial advisor approximately 2006, 2007. This is before I dedicated my life, rededicated my life to God. I had a great schedule. I did whatever I wanted. I went to work late and then left early. I had a girlfriend. I had an apartment. I had a car. I was making more money than I'd ever made in my life. And I was miserable. 
I remember riding a train from San Francisco to Oakland. I was living in San Francisco, working at the office in Oakland, and I would ride what they call the BART train. Anybody know BART? So I rode the BART train over to Oakland on a daily basis. That is, on the days that I chose to go to work. And I remember sitting in a pretty much an empty train because it was like 10.30 in the morning and everyone's already done with their commute. But I was there on my way to the office, and I just remember think thinking this. There's got to be more. There's got to be more to life than this. I'm not happy. I'm not satisfied. I don't feel fulfilled. I don't enjoy my life. There's got to be more to life than this. And the sad thing is that I had an understanding of God. I had an understanding that there was a purpose that was higher than my own. But at this point, I was not willing or able to embrace that call and that purpose that God had for me. But I remember thinking, can there be more? And John's answer to us is this, yes, there is more. Yes, there is a rich and satisfying and abundant life, and it's found in one person. It's found in Jesus. It's found in turning your life completely over to him and allowing him to take control, right? So look at what he's saying to us here. In verse 3 and 4, he's saying first in verses 1 and 2, he says, Jesus is the life, the eternal life, the word of life, and we can have relationship with him. Check this out, verses 3 through 4. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard. So that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Now I want to focus on this word fellowship because it's a deep word. It's a word that actually means a, a communion, joint participation, intercourse, or intimacy. It's, in other words, a word that means a close, intimate friendship, a deep and abiding connection. And John is saying, look, I walked with Jesus. I saw him. I heard him. I know his life. I watched his every move while we were together. And I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that he is worth knowing. That there is life in him that there is not in anywhere else. That you'll never find in any other source. That you'll never find in any other person. And I want you to know that the relationship that I'm enjoying, John, at age 80-something years old, is saying the relationship that I have with Jesus, you can have too. It's not exclusive. It's not just for me. It's for anyone who is willing. And it comes with joy. I love this, life and joy, life and joy. They go together. The joy that you find in Jesus is like a joy you can't find anywhere else. And this is what John is encouraging us to experience. He's saying, uh, this is a deep definition on joy. Joy means joy. Joy means joy. I have some other things up there, cheerfulness, et cetera, but it's real simple. It means joy. I think we all know what that means, and that's what Jesus wants to offer us in this abundant and full life. And so how do we get it? Let's look at just 1 John 2. 24 through 25, just a, a kind of a conclusion from John on what life is all about. You must remain faithful to what you've been taught from the beginning. Again, he's reminding us, don't get off cap, don't get off track, don't believe all this nonsense. There's one thing that's been preached. It's that Jesus really lived, that Jesus really died, and that he really rose again, and it can have an impact on your eternity, and it can have an impact on your today. Now look at this. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. And in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life he promised. It's in this relationship, this fellowship, this close abiding friendship that we find the life that we've been looking for. See, I remember the day that I walked into church not too long after that train ride. And I said, God, I'm tired of living life my way. I'm going to surrender to your will, to your way, to whatever you want me to do. I raised my hands for the first time in probably 10 years, and I felt and encountered the love of Jesus and a life that I'd been longing to live, a life that I had been running from for 10 years, but knowing that that was the only place I would ever find the fulfillment and satisfaction that I needed. Let's look at another thing that John describes Jesus as. This is important. First, he says, Jesus is life. Say, Jesus is life. Jesus. Say it like you mean it. Jesus. Amen. Now, Jesus is light. Say, Jesus is light. Jesus. Look at this verse, verses 5 and 6, same chapter. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. 
God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying. We are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. One thing I want to note about John, this is kind of a side note. I wasn't sure if I was going to share it, but he is not living in a morally relative frame of mind. If you remember, Pastor Marco preached a message about moral and cultural relativism where everyone says it doesn't matter, there's no right or wrong, there's no absolute truth, it's all about how you feel, it's all about what you want to do, it's all about what you think is right. And that is the complete opposite of the truth that we find in God's word. John is saying there is no gray area, there's no in-between. There's lies and there's truth. There's light and there's darkness. There's life and there's death. There's no in-between here, people. You need to understand that when you choose darkness, you're choosing death. When you choose lies, you're choosing death. And when you choose Jesus, you're choosing light. When you choose Jesus, you're choosing truth. When you choose Jesus, you're choosing life. There's no in-between. It's in or out. Look at what light means. Now, light is a deep word because it can be used in a lot of different ways. But basically, a couple of definitions I want to highlight. God, because of light, has an ex- it is used of God because light has an extremely delicate, subtle, pure, brilliant quality. Now, notice the word pure. And the second definition of truth and its knowledge de- uh, together with the spiritual purity associated with it. So truth and knowledge coming with purity. And this word light is always used with purity. It always goes hands in hand. It also goes hand in hand with truth. Truth is a definition here for you. What is true in any matter under consideration, everything as it really is, reality, certainty. Okay? Jesus described himself in John 14, 6 as the way, the truth, and the life. Right? No one can come to the Father except through me. Now let me just describe light to you a little bit. Okay? Light reveals things. I don't want to get too deep. Light reveals things. Now, I was uh, up in Yosemite about, I don't know how many years ago, eight years ago. And um, I was there for four or five days, and I called a friend, a local in the area, and I said, hey, I'm really enjoying my time up here. I wanted to see if there's a place for me to go see some stars. I want to go see some, you know, stars, but it's kind of hard because there's all these trees. It's a lot of, a lot of trees in Yosemite. So he says, okay, perfect. I got the great place for you. You got to just go up at a, this orchard we have. It's about four miles away. He gives me these incredibly complex instructions like, you know, turn left at the gas station, turn right at the blue house, honk three times at the gate, go through that gate, go through another gate. I was like, okay, whoa. So I write it all down, and I actually make it. That was a big deal. There's no GPS up there, all right? So I find the place. I go through the final gate. I'm driving into this orchard, and I can see these rocks. So you say, oh, these rocks are perfect. Where You just sit on those rocks, you'll be able to see all the stars. I get out of my car. I'm super excited. As soon as I shut my door, I hear this. I hear branches breaking. I hear feet pounding towards me. And I'm like, oh, 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 let me get my flashlight. And I just want you to know, I love iPhones, but this light is useless in the wilderness. Okay? At some point, I realized I can't see more than 12 inches in front of me, and all I'm doing is attracting the bear. Come and get me. I don't have a flashlight. So I jump back in my car, I call my friend, I said, hey, is there any chance there's a bear up here? He says, yeah. I said, you couldn't have included that in the very detailed instructions you gave me before I came up here. Thank you. But this is the idea. The light that we're talking about is not like an iPhone light. You know that it actually has no comparison in nature, really. That even if you were to look at the sun, the brightest light in our world It does not compare to the light of Jesus. You know that if you look at the sun up close with a telescope, you'll see there's black marks, there's shadows. But what God is saying and what John is saying is Jesus is not like that light. Jesus is a light that has no shadow. No darkness at all is in him. Whatever he shines on is revealed completely and perfectly. And this is the light that John invites us to come and know. The light reveals things for what they truly are. It shows us what our hearts and lives are really like. 
But it doesn't stop there because this light doesn't just reveal. This light that John describes, the light that is Jesus, also purifies. 1 John 1, 7. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You know how I know that John had a really good picture of who Jesus is? So I, I like to do this. When I think about what John's writing, I like to think about his life. What did he experience? Well, one of the things that I know that John experienced is this moment of transfiguration on the mountain, right? It says in Mark chapter 9, 2 and 3, six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and went up on a high mountain. They were all alone there. While these followers watched him, Jesus was changed. His clothes became shining white, whiter than anyone on earth could make them. So I can just imagine... John, as he's sitting down to write, how can I tell them about who Jesus is? How can I tell them about what he's like? Oh, I know. I remember a moment when I woke up and I looked and I saw the most brilliant, shining light I have ever seen in my life. And then I realized it wasn't just a light from heaven, but that it was actually the light of Jesus himself standing in front of me, completely clothed in the glory of God with a voice from heaven saying, this is my son. And all of a sudden I realized that I'd never seen a true light before, but this is the light that I witnessed. And this is the light that I want you to know. It's a light that has no wrinkle, no spot, no blemish. There's no shadow. There's no darkness in him at all. John saw Jesus in brilliant, dazzling white, as he truly was, without wrinkle or blemish. And then he invites us to know him, to say, you can know this light too. You can experience this light too. Why? Because Jesus gave his life to purify us. I love this scripture. It means even more to me now that I'm married. Shout out to my wife. <laughs> Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Uh, it starts off with just really some instructions on husbands and families. But this is incredible, this picture of what Jesus did for us. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to do what? To make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she would be holy and without fault. This is what I love about Jesus. He is the light and he does reveal those things inside of our lives that need to change. The closer that we draw to this incredible light... The closer that we draw to the light that is Jesus, the more that we will see and recognize there's a few blemishes here. There's some things that I haven't quite figured out yet. There's, so, there's some sins in my life. There's some jealousy. There's some anger. There's, some, there's some, some lust issues. There's some things I need some help with here. There's things that I can recognize don't belong in a righteous, holy relationship with God. And Jesus doesn't just reveal them, he also pays the price so that we can be cleansed of them. And this is the beautiful thing about it. It doesn't require a whole bunch of religious ed education. It doesn't require that you know every verse in the Bible. It doesn't require that you have every, you can identify the spirits that led you there or what generational family curse it was there. It doesn't matter where it came from because all that it requires is for you to say, Jesus, I see the problem. Will you forgive me? Will you cleanse me? Would you shine that light in such a way that every part of the shadow is gone from my life? See, I remember a time not too long after I dedicated my life to God as an adult where I began to see a whole lot of stuff in my life I did not like. Can anybody identify? When I first got saved, I was like, this is not fun at all. I thought he said life abundant. All I feel is guilty and ashamed, and I feel like I'm, I'm failing all the time. I just bit off my sister's head again. I just yelled at my pastor. I just, I, I'm angry all the time. I'm irritable all the time. It's kind of like fasting, but anyway. I just remember turning to a friend at this early stage in my walk and just saying, I feel like a gaping wound walking on two legs. Because the closer I got to Jesus, the more that I pursued him, the more that I saw there were some issues here. 
There were some heart problems that I had. There were some lies that I had been leaving. There had been some problems that I had welcomed into my life, some habits, some patterns of thinking that needed to change, and I didn't know how to change them. I'm brand new to this. I don't know what I'm supposed to do, God, but all I could do and all that God requires is that you say, Jesus, cleanse me, change me, take these things away. I want to be different. I want to be pure. I want to be who you created me to be. And that's what we hear in 1 John chapter 1, 8 through 10. Oh, man. All right, we're getting there. The last, this is like the third thing I'd say that John just identifies Jesus as forgiving. Someone say Jesus is forgiving. Let's read this. This is powerful. I've, I hope you've already got this memorized. But if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Hmm. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. John's not one to pull punches. He's basically like, it's truth or lies. That's it. Either you know you're a sinner and you need Jesus or you don't. And here we have Jesus who forgives the one who admits their sin. I love this quote from Charles Spurgeon. It says, this text simply means treat God truthfully and he will treat you truthfully. Make no pretensions before God, but lay bare your soul. Let him see it as it is. And then he will be faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I love this because I think it speaks to something that I've often asked in the Bible. You know, God all through the Bible says, I hate pride. I abhor pride, right? He's like really, really opposed to pride. There's other things that he says that are not pleasing to him. But this is something he says, I loathe, I hate it. Why? Why? Because it keeps us in bondage. Do you know the only thing that can keep you from being cleansed as you draw close to Jesus is keeping your mouth shut and saying, I don't need help. I don't need Jesus. I don't need a Savior. If you have that pride in your heart that keeps you from expressing that, God, I need your help. I need some help. I need some, something more than I can do on my own. Then you are stuck. If you go out on the street right now and ask somebody, are you going to heaven after you die? I would say probably 100% of them are going to say yes. I very rarely meet someone that says, no, I'm going to go to hell. And when they tell me they're going to heaven, you ask them, well, okay, why? Why are you going? Why are you going to go to heaven? Well, they, again, nine times out of ten, they're going to say something like, well, uh, I'm a pretty good person. Anybody ever heard I'm a pretty good person? How many of you ever said that? I'm a pretty good person. I don't lie. I don't cheat. I don't steal. I never killed anybody. I didn't commit adultery. And this is by far the most awful state a man can find himself in. To think or say, I've only made a few mistakes or I'm only human, puts us in the most dangerous place imaginable. Why? Why is that such a dangerous place to be? Because God's mercy and grace are for sinners. Not those who made a few mistakes. Not those who say, I'm only human. Not those who say, yeah, I think I slipped up a time or two. It's for those who say, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Paul said it in 1 Timothy 1.15. Here's a trustworthy saving that deserves full acceptance. He's saying you can take this to the bank. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Somebody say sinners of who I am the worst. Salvation begins with a simple confession. I am a sinner and I need a savior. I'm not trying to pretend I've got it all together. I'm not trying to act like I, got, I, I don't have an anger issue or I don't have a lust issue or I don't have some other problem in my life. I'm not trying to pretend that I don't, I'm not addicted to alcohol or, or drugs or that I, I, I'm not sexually confused. I know I've got a problem. I may not know how to get out of it. I may not know how to be free of it, but I know I've got a problem. And guess what? I know this. There's got to be a savior out there that can do something about it. There's got to be a savior who is the life, who is the light, who is forgiving, who I can call on and be saved. Confession's an important part of this process. David Guzik in Enduring Word says this, to confess means to say the same as. It's an interesting definition. When we confess our sin, what we're doing is we are willing to say and believe the same thing about our sin that God says about it. 
So when we confess, we are saying the same as. We are saying, God, I recognize this is sin. I recognize that the wages of sin is death. I recognize that this separates me from you. I recognize that this is a problem. Not a small issue, not I made a few mistakes, but this is sin. That's what confession is. Now, Jesus forgives all our sins. It says in verse 7, running out of time here, but verse 7, we can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus from all sin, right? From all sin. Now, that means that we can be cleansed of the sin we inherited from Adam. That means we can be cleansed from the sins we committed as children. That means we can be cleansed from the sins that we committed growing up. That means we can be cleansed of the sins against our father, our mother, our brother, our sister. That means we can be cleansed of the sins against our employers or our employees. That means we can be cleansed of the sins against our friends or our enemies. That means we, became, we can be cleansed from lying, stealing, cheating. That means we can be cleansed from adultery, swearing, drugs, and booze. That means we can be cleansed from pros- promiscuity and murder. That means that... We can be cleansed from the sins that haunt us every day, and we can be cleansed from the sins that we didn't even know we committed. Because all sin, someone say all, all all sin can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus that he shed upon, what was it? The cross. If I'm not preaching the cross, I'm not preaching anything. Because Jesus shed his blood on the cross. Because he died a sinner's death. Because he paid it all. The wages of my sin have been paid. And I can be forgiven. Our sins are not forgiven because we confess. This is important. Sometimes Christians get in their head because of this verse. It's a very powerful verse, a very strong verse. That if I don't confess every sin before I die, I might go to hell. You're not saved through confession. Okay? You're not saved by saying the right prayer or making sure that you've covered yourself in whatever religious exercise you're doing. The only thing that saves us is the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross. It's because he paid the price. It's because he took the punishment that we deserve that we can be forgiven. But confession is, as it says in this passage, very important to maintaining that relationship with God, that fellowship, that close abiding friendship with him. As God convicts us of sin, as that light points out the things that are hindering our fellowship with him, we have to confess, receive forgiveness and cleansing for our relationship with him to continue without hindrance. Now look at this sacrifice one more time because it looks like John is done talking about it, but he's not. In 1 John chapter 2, he goes on to say, my dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. That's important. He's saying, look, you can confess your sins and Jesus will forgive you. But don't treat that as a license to go out and do whatever you want. Don't treat that like some kind of free pass to go ahead. As long as I get into, you know, church by 9 a.m. tomorrow, I'll be good. Some of you guys have been living like the devil Monday through Saturday, showing up on Sundays and thinking that that's going to be good. That doesn't work. That's not what John is talking about. He's saying you can't live that way. I'm not telling you just go out and sin as much as you want. He says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only for our sins, but for the sins of all the world. Last couple parts here. The sacrifice that atones, that's, the sacrifice means that which satisfies the demand, that makes reparation or amends for a wrong or an injury. And this is probably the appropriate time for me to kind of head into an altar call so I'll have the worship team come. But as we talk about this sacrifice that Jesus made, The reason that Jesus made this sacrifice, the reason that he went to the cross, the reason that he paid it all, that he died a sinner's death was so that you could be set free, so that you could be forgiven, so that every one of your sins could be washed away. In 1 John 4, 10, it says, this is actually real love. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. 
I really wanted to get into the last, uh, next part of chapter two, but just for the, I feel like we should land right here because I think there's a lot of us in this room that, that maybe you were like me, walking through a life that you knew you didn't want to live, wondering if there was something more, wondering if there was something that you could change in your life that would bring f- fulfillment or satisfaction. And maybe tonight for the first time you recognize, you know what it really is? I need to surrender my life to God. I need to give Jesus a shot. I need to have him come into my life. Maybe you're like I was in that first year where you're walking towards Jesus, you're drawing closer to him, you're beginning to develop a relationship with him, and all that you can see is the stuff that's wrong inside of you. And you need to say tonight, Jesus, I see the problem. I see the issues. Would you please wash me and cleanse me? Maybe some of you have been dealing with shame, with guilt, with a feeling like you just can't make it, that you're never good enough, and you need to recognize the Jesus who is forgiving, who is faithful and just to forgive us if we will only confess and admit that we need him. Tonight, I want to invite you to know Jesus who is the life. I want to echo John who says you can know him. You can have relationship with him. You can have fellowship with him. You can have a close abiding friendship. And from that relationship, all that you need, all life will, be flow, will flow into your life. The light that you long for will come into your life. The forgiveness that you're desperate for will come into your life because his sacrifice is enough. I said it a couple times, but Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. That means there's a penalty for the mistakes, for the failures, for the sins that we've committed. Romans 3.23 says for all have sinned. 1 John 1.8 says... Anybody that says they haven't sinned is lying. Okay? I like that one better. If if you're saying you're not sinning or you haven't sinned, you're a liar. Wow. Thanks, John. But then that means everybody in here has a death sentence hanging over our heads. Because I'm a sinner. I've sinned. I know I've sinned. I know I've made mistakes. I know that I haven't lived the life that I want. Even yesterday, I've made mistakes that I regret. And God, I, I, I don't know what, what to do then. And Jesus, in his infinite love, said, I know what to do. I'm going to go. I'm going to be born as a little baby. I'm going to walk the earth. I'm going to demonstrate how to live, which is a part of the verse that I wasn't able to cover tonight. And then I'm going to die the death that you deserve. I'm going to die the death that you deserve. The thing that I love about Jesus is I know that I don't deserve his love. I know that I could not have possibly earned it. And yet it's still there for me. It doesn't make sense that Jesus, the perfect sinless one, The life, the light, the most forgiving being in all creation would come and die for me. But he did it, and he did it for you. Tonight, maybe you're you're recognizing I need that life, or I need that forgiveness, or I just need Jesus to cleanse me again. I want to give you the opportunity to surrender 100% to him to walk into a fellowship, a relationship that will change your life forever. A life abundant, the best life that you could possibly live. Do you understand that I described a couple of deep, dark moments in my life, but I haven't described the last 15 years of my life because they've been the most fulfilling, the most satisfying, the most purpose-filled years of my life. Coming to the Wayworld Outreach blew my mind. God does more than you could ever ask, think, or imagine. If you'll surrender to him, he'll walk you into a life that you've longed to live. He'll give you more than you could possibly dream. But it begins with us saying, I need him. I'm a sinner and I need a savior. I'm a mess and I need someone to help me. I don't have the power to do it myself. I need Jesus. And when we pray that prayer and we say that with all sincerity and truth, God will change your life. 
So on the count of three, if you're saying, I need that Jesus, I need a Savior, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. I need Jesus. I need Jesus in this place. I see that hand. 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 I see see it. God sees it. I see you. Come on. Tonight is the night for you to say, I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. So those of you just raised your hand, do me one more favor. Stand up to your feet. Let us give us a round of applause as they come, guys. We want to do, come on down and allow us to pray with you. Allow us to help you on this journey. Allow us to just take this moment to, sh- to pray and to invite you to your next step. There's a big journey ahead of you. It's going to be a life-changing journey. It's going to be a fulfilling journey. It's going to be a purposeful journey. If you're one of those people that's saying, I want Jesus, I need him. I'm a sinner, I need a savior. I'm tired of walking with this darkness in my life. I want Jesus. Come on down. Come on, y'all. Let's give him a round of applause. Let's thank, let's thank God for what he's doing in these hearts right here. People are giving their lives to Jesus tonight. It's the best decision they could possibly make. We're going to take a moment to pray together, but I want you to know the most important thing that you can do, everybody at the altar right now, the most important thing you can do after surrendering your life to Jesus is get into discipleship. Ask somebody, what do I do next? How do I go to the next step? Your next step is starting at the way. We're going to teach you what salvation means. We're going to teach you what baptism is. We're going to teach you how to walk this out, how to live the life that God has for you. All right. Anybody else want to come forward? If you're out there still and you're thinking, hey, you know what? I need to come out. I need to come down. Come on down. We'll wait for you. Come on, church. Will we wait 30 more seconds for a soul to get saved? All right. So right now, let's go ahead and pray. Let's pray. I want you to repeat this prayer after everybody in this room. Repeat this after me. Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. I'm done doing it my way. I'm done living my life. I want to live for you. I surrender. Come into my life now. Reveal whatever it is that needs to change. I am yours. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Would you give it up? Give a round of applause for all these lives that have been changed. Please talk with those people in front of you. Do not leave without making sure you get signed up for your next step. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We pray that you'll come back on Sunday for the next part of the Cross Series. Don't forget we got our softball game coming up. Holy Warriors is launching. You'll be hearing more about some exciting stuff coming. We love you. We look forward to seeing you guys again soon.